Okay, hello everybody. My name is Dmitry. I'm uh, the moderator for the today's talk. And today, Evgeny Pofanovsky is going to present his work on LibTensor library for general block tensor uh, algebra. So, and please, if you have any questions or any concerns, please write it in the questions section and uh, Evgeny will answer them after the presentation. So, okay, so let's listen to Evgeny. All right. Um, hello, my name is Evgeny Hepifanovsky. My presentation today is about um, work I've been doing on uh, tensor, uh, our tensor algebra library. Okay, and so to motivate this work, I begin by showing you the equations in the couple cluster doubles theory. Um, and later in the talk, I will explain where they come from, but um, right now what I would like to show you is um, in the theories that we are interested in, um, the math, the algebra that we compute, involves a lot of um, what we call tensor contractions. And each object you see in this equation, like this F, um, the Bach matrix, or T, uh, the couple cluster doubles amplitudes, or um, uh, these uh, anti-symmetrized selection integrals, they are, all, they are all represented as tensors. These summations are tensor contractions. Basically, tensor contraction where is a generalized matrix multiplication where you take two or more tensors and by summing over some indices, in the end, obtain another tensor. And then finally, P is an, is an anti-symmetrizer and its action is shown below here. And so the couple cluster theory, the couple cluster doubles theory is probably um, one of the simplest in the couple cluster family. And as we go to more complicated theories, these equations only get worse. And so um, the, then the, the question is how do we how do we implement these equations easily and um, how do how do we make the code readable and um, how do we make it so that the process of implementing these equations becomes um, very tractable for, for human? And in fact, this work has been going on for a while. And I would like to present some key publications on this topic. And then I'll start with this, um, in, my, in my opinion, undersided paper by uh, Theresa Windus and um, John Popol, um, the first one ob about object-oriented quantum chemistry. And that was um, back in 1995. That was quite revolutionary, the idea of using object-oriented programming in this field that was dominated by Fortran 77. Um, and another idea that they introduced is um, multidimensional block arrays. So normally, you would have a, say, matrix of two-dimensional array. You could um, yeah, you could design a multidimensional array, but they introduced uh, block arrays implemented using object-oriented uh, methods. And then um, the second is a work by Anna Krilov and David Sherrill uh, back at Berkeley, um, where they implemented a C++ block tensor library in QCAM. Um, unfortunately, this work never got published, but nevertheless, since um, Roughly 1999, uh, people have been using uh, th that code in QCAM. And uh, that code implemented tender contractions. And in fact, this was uh, sort of redesign of this code is what motivated this um, current work. In 2003, Sol Hirata publishes his uh, tender contraction engine, engine and its implementation in, in WCAM. This software is designed to um, compute given matrix elements in um, theories like couple clusters, where the input would be whatever matrix element one would like to compute. And on the output, it generates a somewhat optimal um, computational routine for these equations um, in Fortran 77. And that was part of the massively parallel NWCAM uh, package. And then, Fast forward to 2008, 
Um, a, the ACES 3 team introduces SAIL, Super Instruction Assembly Language, that takes this even further and uh, basically uh, they think of these multidimensional objects as just data objects and then um, generate tender contractions in, um, very sim in a sim similar way as we, um, as, as a processor, a CPU would um, do regular scalar calculations. And so, therefore, this assembly language. And uh, this is uh, from, um, from a group of um, uh, what's called domain-specific languages, um, programming languages that are specific to a certain area of applicability. Um, okay, and then very recent development, um, again from UC Berkeley, is the Cyclops tensor framework being developed in, um, uh, in, chemistry, in um, sorry, in the computer, um, com computer science department there, and uh, by Edgar Salomonic, and I'll mention this um, in more detail in the future because uh, this is, I, in my opinion, a very promising idea. All right. So, what is tensors? What are they? Um, for us, tensors are simply multidimensional tables of numbers. Let me give you a couple of examples from um, from computational chemistry, from quantum chemistry. Suppose we have a Fock matrix right here, and this Fock matrix is defined as a well, matrix in the space of real numbers, and we have an n by n table um, where n is the number of molecular orbitals. Um, and then also we can have two electron repulsion integrals, PQRS, in their anti symmetrized form. And that would be a four-dimensional table of real numbers. And of course we can um, take, the, instead of just taking all molecular orbitals, we can take subsets of them and form, say, this um, occupied, occupied Fock submatrix, or say occupied virtual, and well, the same applies to the um, these two electron integrals. So, what is the problem with tensors? Let's look at how their size changes with the size of the system that we would like to um, consider. And um, I'm taking three typical um, sizes in terms of basis set functions. Um, 300 basis set functions will be something that um, uh, is very tractable on a single computer, and one could, say, compute um, ground or excited states and explore potential energy surfaces, those kind of jobs. And um, the size of all integrals uh, is eight, about 8 gigabytes. And, uh, of course, this is just integrals, and then if we have some other objects in the media, the size would grow, and normally that is actually, there is a factor of 2 or 3 to that in real applications. All right, so then if we go um, to 500 basic functions, that would be something like a single point, probably excited state calculation. Uh, we'll see that the size grows to over 60 gigabytes. And then 1,000, that will be a very, very large uh, calculation for just one computer. And then you see that the size is um, a whole terabyte. And as, as the size grows, um, of course, it outgrows the available computer memory. And the question is, how do we deal with this? And uh, we deal with that by splitting tensors into smaller chunks. And let me present a few ways of doing that. One way, probably the easiest, would be to reduce large tensors into lower dimensional objects. And let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, say you would have a cube, shown here on the left which is a three-dimensional tensor, we can build one representation that's a matrix of vectors. Each vector is called a fiber, um, shown in the middle. Or we can have a vector of matrices, slices, shown on the right. So each individual object will be a reduced dimensionality object in the sense that each fiber is just a one-dimensional vector and each slice is just a matrix, a two-dimensional object. This approach is used in MOPRO. Um, what are the problems? Well, um, one is that this introduces an imbalanced description in, into tensor dimensions. Uh, for example, um, see if we have if you have a cube in the form of slices, the dimensions that are represented in each slice is inherently different from the dimension that's um, 
uh, along this depth axis. And so that makes treating permutational symmetry particularly hard between um, dimensions that are have these different nature. And another problem, well, however, however hypothetical, is that this this way of splitting does not really set a limit on the size of individual objects. For example, um, say we have some um, multi-dimensional tensor, and each slice um, would exist in the virtual 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 molecular orbital space. And um, as we grow to if, as we go to a larger system, uh, the number of virtual orbitals grows potentially can grow indefinitely, and therefore the size of each slice it becomes unlimited in a sense. So that's that's the problems. There is another way implemented in the Cyclops tensor framework, and that's called the cyclic layout. And what it does is it um, basically we have this uh, say symmetric matrix on the left, and we would like to build uh, we would like to split it into smaller smaller uh, chunks. What it does is it assigns a phase and um, distributes this on a grid, like um, here shown on the right, and each each piece contains a um, small portion, um, non-consecutive entries in the original matrix, but um, what, what's, there are two very important things about this. One is that the description in the end is extremely balanced, well balanced, um, and you can see that every piece um, has exactly the same size. And another important thing is that every piece, every small matrix, every small block has exactly the same permutational symmetry as the original matrix. And this is this is a great representation. Unfortunately, as is, it's not very good for um, for quantum chemistry because tensors in quantum chemistry have a block sparse structure. Um, but in the end, I'll mention how to um, how how we can use this together with our concept of block tensors. And here it is. So this is the third way of splitting uh, splitting large tensors into blocks. It's block tensor. Uh, this is probably this approach is probably used in most of a um, couple cluster codes. At least I know in WCAM and ACES and QCAM. Um, this this approach is natural for block sparse tensors. Imagine we have this block matrix on the left. If we if this matrix were a block diagonal matrix, we would only have three blocks on the, on the diagonal that are non-zero and the rest would be zero. So we would not have to store them or deal with them. Um, the way we obtain a block tensor representation from, from, from a full dimensional from a full tensor is that we assign these split points. Um, so where we would uh, do this tiling of, of, um, of tensor into these blocks. So for, for matrices, it's called tiling. Well, for um, for larger dimensional objects, that would be a sort of um, higher dimensional analog of tiling. And so this um, large cube would be um, would be reduced to a bunch of smaller cubes. So each object has the same dimensionality as the original. Um, now there is small imbalance in how we dis when, when we describe the permutational symmetry, and suppose this matrix on the left were a symmetric matrix, then we could only store, say, um, the six blocks on the in the upper triangle, but each block on the diagonal would would have to store twice the number of entries that we actually need because in in itself it would be symmetric. So this is this is the imbalance. But other than that, it's a it's a great way of splitting a large tensor into small ones. And this is indeed the approach that we're going to take. All right. So block tensors. What is a block tensor? It contains three components. The first component, we need to specify what kind of block tensor space that tensor exists in. And the block tensor space is defined by the, the dimensions of the tensor meaning the total number of entries along each of the modes of the tensor plus this tiling pattern. So along each mode, we specify the points, the splitting points, 
that will uh, that will help us break that large tender into smaller ones. Okay, and the second piece that we need is the symmetry, and we we use um, we, we we implement symmetry as symmetry relations between blocks, um, and that what that means is um, basically we store a symmetry element, and these symmetry elements are mappings between um, symmetry unique blocks and sort of replicas. And then in the end, we only store those symmetry unique or canonical blocks. And that's the third piece. So we only store non-zero canonical data blocks, so those blocks that are symmetry unique. OK, let me show you some code that that we could use in order to define this block tender space. OK, so the, the object is called by space. That's the class name. In fact, it's a template. And one is the dimensionality. So it's a one-dimensional space. And we specify this is O, so let's say this is occupied orbitals. And we say that we have eight orbitals in the occupied space. And well, let's say we have alpha and beta. So the first four will be alpha, the second four will be beta. And then we'll want to further split the alpha and beta space into, um, into two more blocks. So we will put a split point on every second, every other, um, at every other element. So, and that it would be this code here. So we, we put split points um, before the second element, before the fourth, and before the sixth element. All right, and let's, let's say we want to define the virtual space that contains 12 um, spin orbits, 6 alpha and 6 beta. And then we would like to place a split point after the, um, after, before the second element. Um, that would be um, this construct in this line. So we would put a split point in the middle uh, before the sixth element and then before the second and the eighth. And the number here starts from zero. Okay, now from these one-dimensional spaces, we would like to form two-dimensional spaces. And so that, that is done by combining these one-dimensional spaces into, say, this occupied or occupied or occupied virtual or virtual virtual spaces. Now these two-dimensional or n-dimensional in, in, in general spaces inherit the block the split, sort of the tiling pattern of the, uh, fr from the one-dimensional. Uh, spaces. So the tiling pattern is specified inside this individual O and V. Okay, and then once we have this space, we can create an actual tensor, um, a, a class that's called V tensor. Two is the dimensionality, and say F O O could be our POC matrix in the occupied occupied space, um, and likewise F O V and F V V. At this point, we have an empty tensor that exists in a certain tensor space, but we have not yet specified its symmetry um, or data. So it's, it's completely empty. All we have is just um, sort of the size parameters of that tensor. OK. Let me talk about symmetry a little bit. I mentioned that symmetry is the relationship between blocks. So what is it exactly? Right now, I have three. Uh, types of symmetry, permutational point group and spin symmetry, those are found in uh, quantum chemistry calculations. But at the same time, we have a, in the library, we'll have a mechanism to add new elements. So in principle, if, say, a new application arises where a different kind of symmetry is required, that would be uh, very straightforward to implement. All right, so um, we have the symmetry, a set of symmetry elements, S, um, so each symmetry element is, is S, and then S acts on a certain block BI, and then maps it onto a block BJ, um, actually maps it to a pair of a blo another block BJ in a transformation from I to J, so UIJ. Let me give you examples. So consider we have permutation symmetry, shown here on the left. What we would normally do is just store the symmetry unique blocks, that is the, this upper triangle of this matrix. If we would like to get the lower triangle blocks, the white ones that are not explicitly stored, we would have to take the symmetry unique block, which is um, the 
corresponding block above the diagonal, say this block B, and obtain this mapping from block B to the to this um, non-canonical block. And the transformation would naturally be the, uh, the transposition and perhaps a change of sign if, if, if instead of symmetry we have anti-symmetry. And that's the symmetry, that's the that's the permutational symmetry element. And again, if we if we have to act with this permutational symmetry element on a non-canonical block below the diagonal, so this one, it will map it back to B. Because that's a simple permutation between two indices. Okay, so then the second element is uh, here in the middle, the point group symmetry element. This this symmetry element is used to identify which blocks are zero or non-zero due to molecular point group symmetry. In order to use it, we group molecular orbitals by their irreps, reusable representations. So each block, every every orbital in a block comes from uh, comes from the same irreducible representation. And so then we can assign um, either, we can then say whether a certain block is zero or not by taking the product of uh, the product of irreducible representations from each dimension. Consider this matrix. Um, let's say the target the target irreducible representation is B1 in this case. Suppose it's a it, this matrix is from um, say an EOM. Um, R1 amplitudes. Okay, and so uh, the target the target label is B1, and so this symmetry element will take a product for each of these blocks. We'll take the product. So for this one, will be A times A is A. So, but the target is B1, so this block is zero. Say for this block, it will be B1 times A, which is B1. So again, the, uh, and then th that means this this block is allowed, and then let's take this one, for example, the product will be B3 times B2, which is B1, and so this this block will be again allowed, but let's look at this one, it's B3 times B3, which is A, and so that block is not allowed. That's how this element works. In the end, it returns whether the block is zero or not. All right, and so the third type of symmetry is the spin symmetry, shown on the right, what this symmetry element does is it partitions the tensor, or matrix in this case, into alpha and beta parts. And um, so that in, in the, the tiling pattern in alpha is exactly the same as the tiling pattern in beta. That way we can map, say, this alpha alpha block onto the beta beta block. And so this beta beta block would not be explicitly stored but rather, um, the, the spin symmetry element would map each block from alpha alpha onto the corresponding block of beta beta. Like this block B will be mapped onto um, this upper right block in the beta beta partition. And at the same time, this spin, this spin symmetry element can say whether a certain combination of spins is not allowed. For example, this alpha beta or beta alpha blocks um, they are not allowed, say, in the block matrix, where we have on alpha, alpha, and beta, beta. All right, so this is the action of spin symmetry elements. And then, once we have created our block tensor, we can then put the symmetry elements, the appropriate ones, into it, and use some symmetry algorithms available in the library to, say, obtain a list of canonical blocks that are allowed by symmetry, and then that would be uh, potential non-zero blocks, and then we can fill the tensor with data. And that's how, that's how we prepare a tensor for, for the calculations. Once we've initialized the input tensors and put them into the expressions that I'll show in a minute, the, re the symmetry of the results is automatically computed by the library. And so, say we don't need to figure out what kind of permutational or spin symmetry the result would be. And in a sense, this is an automatic way of, for example, spin adaptation. 
So if we have a complicated expression in which we don't know what, how the spin symmetry in the end would work, this, these algorithms are able to figure this out, to compute what kind of spin symmetry of, of the result would be. OK. And so a couple of words about the program interface in the library. Um, we have we have most mo most frequently used tensor algebra operations implemented, and some of those are um, say scaling, uh, multiplication by a scalar, addition, um, inner and outer products, contraction probably the most important one. And then element-wise, multiplications, direct summation, di diagonal extraction, and then symmetrization and anti-symmetrization. So these are probably all, all the operations that you um, one would see in a couple cluster theory equations. Uh, and um, um, how exactly that's used, I'll show you in, the, uh, in a minute in the use case that we're going to uh, that we're going to go through. Um, okay, so this is the couple cluster doubles, the simplest method in couple cluster, in couple cluster family. Um, and I'm going to walk you through how one would program couple cluster doubles using the infrastructure presented by uh, the Okay, so what is CCD? Uh, it's very simple. Uh, we use this exponential ANSAS for the um, for the couple cluster wave function, and the T2 is the cluster operator that can be represented in the second quantization form, and the T I J A B would be the couple cluster doubles amplitudes. T I J A B is a is an anti-symmetric, partially anti-symmetric tensor. It's anti-symmetric with respect to the permutation of I J and A B. Okay, and so um, the then we solve this system of nonlinear equations, and so we have um, O squared B squared variables, and this equation generates um, O squared B squared equations. So we have a system of nonlinear equations, and then we use a linear solver with dice acceleration to to solve for these t, t amplitudes. All right. Okay, so what would be involved in doing that? Um, this slide shows the components in QCAM that, um, that are used to implement uh, CCD and other methods. And I'll show you which ones would be involved. Okay, so we have this top level um, sort of drivers kind of uh, routines. So in CCMAN2, we would have all our couple cluster and e equation of motion methods. So this is top level, top level routines, and CCMAN two would use. Um, well, one it would use Lib Legacy, which is a library to extract input data from QCAM, and that would be things like Fock matrix, integrals, and all other things like that. So basically, we read the input from from QCAM, and say if we were to use CCMAN two with some other package other than QCAM, what we would have to do is re-implement with legacy so we, we can interface with, um, with that other package. Okay, so then we have this libcc, which is a library of couple cluster and DOM equations. All the actual equations will be coded in there. Then we would need libsolve, which is a library of generic solvers. It's um, it's not specific to, uh, to quantum chemistry. Those are just um, generic um, linear and Dyson Davidson solvers. All right, and then we would have the tensor, which is the library I'm presenting here. Again, this library is not is not tied to quantum chemistry. Can be used in any other applications, uh, in any other application, and um, Yes, yeah, so this performs standard algebra. And then we will have some low-level things. Um, I'm not going to mention them today, but yeah, so this, this is just helper libraries. 
Okay, so those are the essential components. Okay, and so if we were to implement the CCD solver, what we would do is, um, just like this code shows, we would import integrals, so import our data, input data from somewhere, say QCAM, and then we would make our initial guess. For CCD, that would be the MP2 T2 amplitude, um, normally, and so that, that's our initial guess. And then we would form our CCD die solver. And I'll show you in a second how this solver is uh, designed. And then we would set the guess, then run the solver, and um, check that we actually converge, that the number of iterations did not exceed the set maximum, and then extract the result and say print it. Okay, this is our simple CCD solver, uh, CCD solver function. Okay, so the actual die solver, what will we do? We, we wanted to use the libsol, the generic solver from libsol. And the way it works is we would derive a class called, say, CCD die solver. That will be a solver that's specific to CCD from this generic die solver. And specify what kind of, what type of vectors we're using. That the vector type would be CCD amplitudes. And then how to do um, linear algebra on these vectors. That will be CCD amplitudes algebra and then how to run an update uh, multiplied by this um, the matrix. So that would be the update procedure. We we'll have to tell the solver how to do that. And finally, how to check for convergence. Okay, so when, how do we find out that we have to stop? And um, OK, so to updates, we, uh, we create this CCD update policy class which would contain the update function. And um, that function, what it does is it takes the current CCD amplitudes, T old, and generates new CCD amplitudes. Okay. And then, well, so here I just call this, um, this other function that's called CCD to update. Um, in a second, I'll show you how it's, um, um, what it looks like. All right. And finally, we have this convergence policy. Um, we check for convergence, well, this, this, name is a little bit misleading because it really is a termination policy. So we either converge, that will be the second criterion, so the norm of the error will be below a certain threshold, or we run out of iterations. And remember, after running the uh, solver, we check whether we have actually converged or ran out of iterations. So this simply returns true or false, whether we should continue or stop. Okay, now let's go back to the CCD um, T2 updates. Here's what it looks like, the update procedure. In CCD, we would form four intermediates, um, two that are sort of effective Fock matrices and then effective two electron integrals. And um, those are the simple contractions. And then um, compute the new T, the new T2, um, using um, the integrals and T2 matrix, um, sorry, T2 tensor, and then these intermediates. Uh, and this is the implementation of the complete implementation of the equations that I showed you in the very beginning. So you can see that um, with this interface, uh, what you see in the code is, well, basically what you get. So it's, uh, it's very easy to compare this to the actual mathematical um, equations on the paper. And that was one of the primary goals of designing this library so that it has this very easy to use interface, a programming interface. And th this, this, I hope, proves that um, it is, well, in fact, easy to use and read and maintain. Okay. All right, so that's it for um, coding and API. And uh, this library it has been developed for um, for a few years now, and so it's in, it's a, in the production stage. And so I would like to impress you with some benchmarks that we have. And um, yes, and by the way, so this these benchmarks um, are going out in a, in a paper that we're going to publish and submit pretty soon. Um, so okay, so first what we do is we compare 
the results from our previous code in QCAM, CCMAN. So the new code is called CCMAN2, the old one is CCMAN. And then, yeah, so the old one was developed, um, it, it, its development started uh, with Anna Krilov and David Sherrill, of course, there were um, many, conf many uh, contributors later on. But, yeah, so, okay, so let's look at, first, let, let's look at the, um, at, perform at, at the performance on just one core, okay? So what we have in this table is, so th this left column is data um, timings from CCMAN, on in the right column we have timings from CCMAN2, the number of cores used. Okay, so this is the serial performance. We see that uh, CCMAN2 on just one core is um, roughly, let's see, um, so roughly 20% faster, and uh, this is a uh, this is a direct comparison. Um, as some of you know, in the old code, we did not have the restricted hardship fog. We, we could not take advantage of the restricted reference. All couple cluster, all couple cluster calculations were unrestricted. And so I'm, I'm comparing with the unrestricted calculation in CCMAN2. But we're doing exactly the same number of floating point operations here. And CCMAN2 appears to be more efficient. And also, if we look at parallel performance, and this is a single node, so multi-core shared memory um, implementation. So as we go up number of cores, and 12 is the maximum on that computer, uh, we see that the, CC, the first CCMAN uh, has trouble scaling, um, you know, get, getting more than fourfold speed up, even on eight and 12 cores. Um, and the new code gets an eightfold speed up on 12 cores, which is, which is I think, um, quite impressive. And yeah, so this, this this is the case. This is a small case where um, full calculation fits in memory. So all the bottlenecks or uh, sort of um, inefficiencies are due to the intrinsic implementation of linear algebra in in, um, in CCMAN or CCMAN2. Okay, and so the new code can take advantage of restricted um, Hartree-Fock reference, and uh, we can see that it's an additional um, two-fold improvement, uh, and again, so because the, si the, the, the problem size in, in case of RHF is slightly smaller than UHF, so this, the scaling gets um, lower, but uh, nevertheless, it's an additional improvement that one can take advantage of, and so you can see that overall, it's, um, if we compare the old code with the new code, it's, um, it ends up being more than three times faster. Okay, so then we um, we would like to look at where the CPU time is actually spent and what, what are the inefficiencies in the code. And we consider this some, uh, sorry, not mentioned, but this is a uh, methyl uracil, um, uh, hydrated methyl uracil example with um, roughly 300 basis of functions and uh, CS symmetry. All right, so this is a repeat of the data that we just saw. And then I break down the CPU time onto three uh, most important computational kernels, uh, which are the matrix multiplication kernel, uh, the tensor permutation or transposition kernel, and symmetry overhead. And um, in this in this example, um, the symmetry overhead well uh, stays below five percent, which is um, which is good because, uh, yeah, so this is a lower, lower symmetry uh, CS group. Um, we don't have much symmetry overhead. Um, what's interesting in this particular example is that the permutation overhead grows as we increase the number of cores. And that happens because as we use more cores and try to do these permutations in parallel, there is a very high load on the memory controller and simply we would just um, hit this um, memory bandwidth bottleneck. And this is why, and that scales very poorly. This is why the, the, uh, the fraction of matrix permutations, in tensor permutations in the case, grows as we, um, as we add more cores. And then because of that, mostly because of that, the fraction of matrix multipliers goes down. Okay, because 
um, that a fraction of the time is taken by these computations. In fact, if we just looked at the matrix multi multiplication time, we would see that it scales almost perfectly. So the scaling coefficient for that for ju for the just just that kernel will be more than 11 in the case of 12 cores. So this this um, really solely comes from the fact that uh, the permutation step runs in, into memory bandwidth alone. Okay, and so let's consider um, in this bottom table a larger example, which is a um, which is a, um, a, a methyl uracil dimer with a water molecule, and that's um, almost 500 basis set functions and no point group symmetry. Um, because in, in this in this second example, the size of the all data objects is about um, 250 gigabytes, I believe. And we only have 100 gigabytes of memory that we use in this calculation. Um, that results in uh, doing extensive input output, so basically saving some parts of tenders on disk and then loading them back from disk and so on. And therefore, the scaling coefficient as we, as we use more cores goes down because that input output simply doesn't scale. But if we look at just CPU cycles, if we exclude the I/O wait time, just you um, look at the CPU, we see that the matrix multiplies in that case take 90% and over, and the time spent on permutations goes significantly down compared to the first example. And so um, the the fraction of permutations still grows slightly as we use more cores, but um, the absolute number is much lower, so it's 5% uh, below. And then symmetry, again, introduces very low overhead. Okay, so why, why, is permutation, um, why does permutation take so little time this time? It's because what, when we do permutations, they are done on a lower um, dimensional, um, on, on, with a lower scaling. So say we would, would like to do a matrix multiply, but we wanted to commute the matrix um, if the dimension each dimension of the matrix is n, then the, this, the computational cost of a permutation will be n squared, but the computational cost of a matrix multiply will be n cubed. So as we go to larger matrix, then because of the scaling, matrix multiplies will always um, take long. Uh, after a certain limit, the matrix multiply will always, be, will always take longer than the permutation. And so that's exactly what we see here. Um, because this is a much larger example, matrix multiply start to dominate strongly. Okay, so another test that we did is um, dependence on how much time does it take for a calculation to complete using different memory limits. Here I have to say that in the CCMAN2, the memory limits are strictly enforced, and that's unlike um, CCMAN, where, um, where memory limit will be simple recommendation for the code to use, but in CCMAN2, it will not take more memory than one specifies. And therefore, if, um, say, say, in this case, if we specify very little memory, say this 10 or 20 gigabytes out of the 128 gigabytes available on the node, uh, it will only use that memory. It will not um, use any more than that. And that leads to extensive input output, of course. And therefore, it, it becomes very inefficient. Uh, and I computed this idle metric, which would mean, um, so all these calculations are done with 12 cores. And the way idle is computed is I take total CPU time, which I compute by uh, wall time times 12 cores. And then I divide the actual busy CPU time, so busy cycles, um, divide by the total CPU time, and that would be a fraction that's uh, when CPU CPU is busy. So that fraction of cycles, the CPU is busy. And so the, the rest, so one minus that, would be the idle. So when, um, when it's not busy, it's idle. And this idling could be due to three reasons. One is waiting for input output. Um, the second reason. Um, would be resource contention. Um, and the third reason would be load imbalance. 
And so we see that when we specify very little memory, we have a lot of idle time, and that's, ma that's mainly due to the waiting for input outputs. Because as we go um, up in memory, and then 40, 60, and 80, that's when uh, the problem fully fits in memory. We see that, that um, idle time drops significantly to about 10%. Okay, and so this is this is the ten percent that is basically um, s sort of scaling um, bottlenecks, um, resource contention, and um, and load imbalance. Okay, and so this might be disappointing that uh, it, it it spends you know three quarters of the time um, idling in when we specify very little memory, but at the same time. Uh, having, you know, giving a job 10 gigabytes of memory out of 128 and using all 12 cores will be logical. That's a simply an imbalanced um, use of computational resources. One would want to give it as much memory as possible. And so uh, it could be a problem or it could not be a problem at all. So one would not be using, it, using the code in this, in this regime. Okay, and then let's go to this larger example, 400, um, almost 500 base set functions, our second test. And then here, um, this example does not fit in memory. So it's about 250 gigabytes of data size. We only, we only let it use, oh, sorry. Um, right, so we, um, we only let, let it use, okay, so, so this 100 gigabytes is, uh, should not be here. So, okay. We don't let it use 40, 60, 80, or 100 gigabytes. And you see that the idling time, uh, mostly due to uh, input output, it's, it stays very stable. So around 40, 40%. So a general recommendation for using this code would be to, of course, give it as much memory as possible um, and let it do its own um, input output the way it's, it schedules it uh, because um, it, perhaps it does it better than the, than the operating system in cache. Uh, so the, um, the CCMAN2 would, would make better use of memory than the operating system. Okay, so um, now let's compare oh yeah, how do we look um, compared to other packages. And so we are comparing with the latest release of MoldPro. MoldPro is considered one of the best uh, for, a couple, for its couple cluster codes. Um, and, um, okay, so again, we're considering this um, first um, system, um, roughly 300 basis of functions. And here are the timings per, c per couple cluster single and doubles aggregation. Okay, so on one core, um, CCMAN2 would be slightly slower, roughly 5% slower. But if you look at how it scales with the number of cores, you see that these, um, it, it scales slightly better than MoPro. And so in the end, it crosses over in actual leads. So even with eight processors, it takes less time. Um, and um, yeah, so one thing that's important to mention here is that um, CCMAN2, while it uses um, while it uses spin symmetry, the equations are not completely spin adapted in the sense that there is still an additional factor of about um, um, about three, I think, that. Um, That, that that these equations um, can can be computed cheaper, so um, well the factor will be one over four one quarter. All right, so and then MolPro has a code where the equations are fully spin adapted, and so MolPro does about one quarter of the floating point operations. And um, so and nevertheless, the current CCMAN um, code, CCMAN2 code, is still takes the same times, so even though it does four times more work. Okay, and so the fair comparison in that case would be looking at a unrestricted reference, in which case both MoPro and CCMAN2 do exactly the same amount of work. 
And, well, unfortunately, we were not able to get scaling data from MoPro, um, so it would not run on more than one core. So we only have one data point. And we see that TCMan2 takes half the time as MoPro uh, to, to do a CCSD, an unrestricted CCSD aggregation. Okay, so, and then as, um, as a couple of stress tests, um, very large examples to check whether the um, library is robust in actual scale. We start to um, creep into the uh, pair, um, sort of uh, extreme parallel turf um, software like MW Chem that uses thousands of cores to 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 in a couple of cost of calculations. And so we took one, one example from their benchmarks, which is this oligoporphyrin dimer, and we have its picture here. It's a double zeta basis at almost 1,000 basis set functions. Uh, fortunately, it has a very high point group symmetry, D2H. Um, so the data size is only six, um, 660 gigabytes. And again, we compute on a node that has 128 gigabytes of available RAM. And um, each CCSD iteration computed with QCAM with the new CCMAN2 code um, on all 12 cores available takes um, over just over 13 hours. That equals to 160 CPU hours right here. And with MWCAM that runs, it takes 1,024 cores to run the same calculation. It takes, um, it takes um, much, much less in the absolute terms, it only takes 810 seconds, but computed uh, scaled by the number of cores, it used 230 CPU hours. So in this sense, even though if you can take much longer in absolute terms, um, it saves a lot of energy by taking less CPU hours. And there are further improvements that are available. Um, currently um, in development, our a RISE CCSD code that uses the resolution of the identity approximation for the electron integrals reduces this time almost two times to seven, um, roughly eight hours, but that ends up being 94 CPU hours. And so this is the kind of system that uh, will soon be um, very doable, even on just a single node, very reasonable calculation to do. And then the second big, ex big, big example I would like to present is the the tetramer of nuclear bases, this AATT in the triple zeta basis set, it has a total of 966 basis set functions and no symmetry, but we apply the frozen core um, approximation and also the frozen natural orbital approximation that reduce the size of both occupied and virtual spaces. And in the end, we have this um, 98 occupied orbitals and 551 virtuals. The size of all data in this calculation is about one terabyte. And again, we'll compute a node with 12 cores and um, 128 gigabytes. We'll limit the memory size at 100 gigabytes. Each CCSD iteration takes about 60 hours. So this is a kind of calculation that um, one would probably not like to do. But nevertheless, we see that um, it is certainly possible. And yeah, if we would really like to do this, it, it, it is doable. Okay, and now let me spend um, a few minutes talking about what kind of directions are uh, for future development of the library. One is to use computational accelerators. And those are devices like NVIDIA or AMD GPUs. NVIDIA uses the CUDA technology. Um, and use OpenCL or Intel Mini Integrated Core um, using Silk, those different programming techniques. Uh, so, but the nature of these is 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 roughly the same. So, um, it's a it's a PCI Express card that one would insert into the computer, and then it has its own onboard, very fast memory, much faster than the usual CPU uh, sort of. Uh, the memory bandwidth is much higher than the CPU 
RAM uh, bandwidth. Uh, and, and at the same time, it has uh, a lot of cores. Each, each core is, uh, is a crippled core. It, it, it's very simple, very power efficient, but this card has a lot of them. And so that's this uh, super parallelism is, 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 the, is the point of these accelerators. And Kirill Kistyaev has completed a pilot implementation of the CCSD parenthesis T code. Um, and this is available in the development version of QCAM. Uh, and so in this, in this code, CCSD is done the conventional way on the CPU with memory. And then the parenthesis T correction is computed um, on the accelerator and um, on an NVIDIA card. The way it's done is that we copy all the data from, from the main memory to the GPU memory and then compute that uh, parenthesis T equation. Okay, and then in a small example, I just show you, um, this is just the first timing. I have to make a disclaimer that uh, this code, um, in fact, both of these codes, um, conventional and GPU codes, are sort of pilot codes, and so um, they're not the most efficient, not most possibly efficient codes, but nevertheless, so if we do this calculation of 12 cores, regular, um, it completes in um, roughly uh, five minutes. And then um, if we do the same on a NVIDIA Tesla card, it, it's, it's just marginally, um, it's marginally longer. So right now we're at, at this level. But uh, of course, both of these can be, uh, both of these codes can be improved and uh, sort of as a, as a kind of um, benchmark. Um, if we do the same calculation with MolPro, it, it takes only 45 minutes. So um, there, is a, there is a pretty large factor that, that is still there and that's for, up for improvement. And, but the, the, so this area is still under development. Okay, and so another thing is we, what we would like to do is um, integrate with the Cyclops Tensor Framework. I mentioned that in the beginning, it's being developed by Edgar Solomonic at uh, the CS department at Berkeley, UC Berkeley. And this is a... Uh, parallel um, uh, so for this this is um, um, this is a kind of code code that runs on um, thousands of cores um, or um, supercomputer with many nodes and so what's important here is um, how it scales with um, with number of used cores and the design idea is to not provide very good, uh, very good serial performance, but rather scale. Okay, so the performance on single, um, on a single processor is less important than the actual scaling as we go um, as we increase the number of cores used. And so uh, this uh, Cyclops does a great job doing just that, and um, it, it would be a great idea, I think, to sort of take, um, so LibTensor uh, does great at the single node, um, multi-core um, in that area. And so if we wanted to take it to the, um, to, you know, to use it on thousands of nodes, that would be the way to do this. So, and then the way we would like to do this is to integrate it with, um, with Cyclops. And how that will be done is well, so we, uh, in the block tensors that we have, uh, we would still handle the spin and point group symmetry, but then each block, so that would be a pretty large block, uh, so within each spin and grep, would be a CTF tensor. So uh, then uh, because spin and, and um, point group symmetry are handled by loop tensor, all that's left is the permutation symmetry and CTF is great at handling computational symmetry. So I think um, this would be a very, uh, very good cooperation. Okay, and with this, um, let me thank you for listening. And uh, I would like to just mention that LibTensor is finally a production quality product. And um, it's, it's available for download. It's, uh, it's uses Free. There is a license that's very, very um, uh, permitting, and um, CC equation of motion and 
algebraic diagrammatic construction codes in PureCAM are already implemented using LiveTensor. And uh, since this library is growing, there are lots of plans for the future. We very welcome new developers and users. And um, uh, thank you. Um, uh, uh, I would like to thank Anna Kulov's group and people from the group and then Michael Wormitz, uh, my collaborator on this library. Um, and thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Jenya. So now we are ready to take the questions from our attendees for Jenya. So please write it in the question section and Jenny will ask, answer them. Well, you can start with these questions from our group. So, okay, yeah. Well, maybe we'll tell you a bit. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, well, my question is, why on GPU? The times of is exactly the same on CPU. Yeah so, so, yeah, so Anna asking is why the timings on the GPU are exactly the same on, as on the CPU, even for we have much more cores on GPU. Yeah, okay. so, um, so, like I said, both of these codes are uh, in their development stage, and each of them has its own inefficiencies. If, um, if each of these were perfectly optimized and, uh, you know, production level codes, then we'll probably see a different timing and uh, my expectation is that uh, there would be a factor of um, somewhere between, um, well, it's very hard to say, but um, I'm hoping somewhere between 4 and 10, um, where on the NVIDIA card would be faster than Intel Xeon. But uh, this is sort of a, just to compare that, uh, it's not anything crazy to do this on a GPU. We can, even with this this pilot code, um, it's it's completely it's, it's a completely acceptable result. Yeah. Yes. I also want to add and to Jenny and Lux and Tiani that uh, this is like the not the latest Nvidia card. Uh, so uh, the yes. latest. One is probably like um, eight times faster than uh, this ME card. And uh, uh, Xeon processor is not the, also the latest one, but the latest Xeon processor is probably under like two times, two, three times faster than uh, the one that we have on this slide. So, so the main idea that this GPU also this, the speed, uh, the um, growth of the uh, computational power is much like steeper, so this like later generations you can get much better time than this new CPU. Yeah, so Kirill, the developer of uh, GPU code for uh, Kukem is saying that uh, this uh, video card is not the latest version of the uh, video cards, and I think, uh, and he says that the latest version, like of video cards with Fermi architecture, is like eight times faster than this one, and the current trends, like the current growth of the computational power on GPUs, is much faster than on the CPU. So he's expecting that it's going to be better and better. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, are there any other questions from other attendees? Please write it in this chat. I cannot see anything. Yeah, people are not asking anything. Okay. So, any other questions? Um, maybe one quick comment about when. Uh, Jenny was comparing uh, and WKM uh, code performance with uh, QKM. It's not only like uh, power and time, but this uh, system is multiple process. They are much more expensive than like this regular process that we use. So, and also they have not only like more CPU power, but they also use much more memory. That's why it's also the really fast. Yeah. 
Yeah, the, the Kirill has the comment on the comparison between QCAM and uh, multi-parallel and, and WCAM, but these systems were much larger, they have much more cores, and they are, of course, much more expensive, so you need to also take into account these issues. They are free, um, free. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, if you have access... Yeah, that's probably one of the arguments. You can convince government to give money to QCAM, because it's much more efficient yeah. in terms of mining. So any other questions? Yes. Yes. So okay. okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anya, for your nice talk.